Please join me in prayer. Shine your light on us this morning, O oh God, we pray. How we need your direction. How we crave your guidance. Instruct us in the way to go and teach us as we listen for your word now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We have two readings this morning. The first is from the prophet Isaiah. We're in chapter 60 and verses 1 through 6. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and God's glory will appear over you. Nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look around. They all gather together, they come to you. Your sons shall come from far away, and your daughters shall be carried on their nurses' arms. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and rejoice, because the abundance of the sea shall be brought to you, the wealth of the nations shall come to you. A multitude of camels shall cover you, the young camels of Midian and Ephah. All those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and frankincense and shall proclaim the praise of the Lord. The New Testament reading is from Matthew's Gospel, a very familiar reading. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Listen for a word from the Lord. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea. For so it has been written by the prophet, And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. <clears throat> Hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. <clears throat> not up there, is it? Listen for what the Spirit is saying to us. They left for their own country by another road. That is probably the most enlightening sentence in the entire Epiphany tale. That of the wise men fleeing conflict by avoiding the anger of King Herod, who had purportedly sent them on a fact-gathering mission. Tell me where the Christ child is so that I may go and worship him too. These magi, however, would have none of it. For they are not in the business of searching out God's truth only to fulfill a political errand for a frightened, power-hungry monarch. These wise men, in going home by another road, are exercising their right of descent, their right to be wise and discerning, and their freedom of conscience in making their own informed decision. Our Presbyterian Book of Order, in fact, contains a similar phrase. It says, God alone is Lord of the conscience. 
God alone is Lord of the conscience. Not some king, not some president, not some religion, and not some political philosophy. No, but God. God alone is Lord of the conscience. What does that phrase mean for us today as we too seek to follow God's star? to live in Christ's light. What does it imply that God alone is Lord of the conscience? Could it mean that we are not only to love God with our heart, soul, and strength, but also with our mind, and most determinedly with our mind? Indeed, then, how are we to love God with our mind? As it happens, we have a lot of university professors in our congregation. Perhaps they can help us to understand how to love God with our minds. We have a book of confessions in our Presbyterian Church Constitution to go along with our book of order. Maybe it can help us to love God with our mind. And we have the Bible, letters and narratives and history and parables, surely it can enable us to love God with our mind. But here's the thing, my friends. Throughout the scriptures, the mind is never, ever treated in isolation from the emotions. As a practical example, in the Gospels, when Jesus famously cleanses the temple. He doesn't just say, you know, I'm intellectually bothered by this, the temple being used as a marketplace. It upsets me logically. No, but Jesus emotionally turns over the tables in that marketplace of the vendors and the merchants. In essence, he is saying that he loves the thought of God's unblemished house but he's also honoring its dignity with his strong emotions. The mind and the emotions go together. We have an instance of this kind of emotion in the Old Testament too, in the Isaiah passage that we've just read this morning. Arise, says Isaiah to the people of God. Arise and shine, for your light has come. Now, it's difficult to arise and to shine without being emotional about it, without getting excited about it. Indeed, we need to allow ourselves to feel it, to be God's followers. Like the Magi, we need to follow that star with enthusiasm, wondering what we shall find as a result of our mindful perseverance. Yes. Excitement is important. Enthusiasm, a Latin meaning in God. Enthusiasm is necessary. And emotion is vital. Yes, even as Presbyterians. Still by itself, emotion is not enough. For as I say, our minds need to be completely engaged in God's work as well. We must always be thinking. To be a thoughtful Christian today is so very critical in this world of ours where an overload of information comes at us every day, where myriad decisions are demanded of us. Sometimes even before we've read the morning news, before we've had our morning coffee, or even arrived at our offices, we are deluged with the ability and the determination and the requirement to make decisions with so much to decide, with so many choices to be made, how precisely do we love God with our minds? The Magi can give us some direction here. For in fact, the word Magi itself indicates that these three kings were actually philosophers or astrologers. Now, we may not believe in astrology today, I certainly don't put much stock in the fact that I am a Virgo or that you might be a Gemini or a Sagittarius. Nevertheless, these wise men were busy thinking about the deeper things in their world. 
and trying to make sense of life's mysteries. Mysteries for them, like why? Why, for instance, have the people of Israel been singled out as God's chosen people and therefore own a special place in God's heart? What do their ethics, what does their lifestyle represent? And why is Bethlehem so prominent in their identity? Finally, what might that city symbolize for them today? My sisters and brothers in Christ, we also might thoughtfully ask similar questions about the destiny of our country and its cities today. Of course, we need to do so very carefully because, after all, we are no chosen people as Americans. We are no destined nation as the Israelites were, but we are unique, and I think we could all agree on that. And thus, we must use our minds to ask, what difference are we making as a nation, as a people in our world today? In the midst of recent political and international actions, what does our democracy really mean today? What can it represent for others? In short, what does making God alone Lord of our conscience entail? Now those are good questions. Yet to adequately answer them may mean approaching them by another road. That is, by not coming at them in the way that we've always come at them. Namely, we need to look at them differently and expand the box in which we usually frame those questions. You know, I do a lot of reading about systems thinking, about systems, and to understand a system, one needs to take a step back from it and look at it from the outside, objectively. That's difficult to do. By way of illustration, as a kid, whenever I wanted to see my neighborhood in a new way, I would climb the tree in our front yard and hang upside down from its branches. Yes, indeed, it's risky endeavoring to see things in a new way. But my friends, we must do it, especially today. Otherwise, we get sucked into the unhealthy systems that we are attempting to change. It's true. When the wise men went home by another road, they were, in effect, transforming their very future forever. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, wrote American poet Robert Frost. And sorry I could not travel both and be one traveler, long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other. Oh, I kept the first for another day, yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. By which road are you traveling home today? And I mean physically. Uh, I always exit the church parking lot on Highland, turn right onto Lincoln Way, then drive all the way up to North Dakota Avenue and turn right. It's, of course, the fastest way home. But what if I were to take a different road today? What might I see that I normally don't? And how might it cause me to see all things differently? Could my seeing differently be a metaphor? That is, where in my life do I need to open my eyes and look around anew at the world? And how about you? What's new lately in your vision, in your experiences, in your Christian understanding? Are you being forced to change somehow? Do you feel that, that it's too much? Or are you choosing? to view things from a new angle, from a different perspective. You see, it really doesn't matter if change is being foisted upon us or not. The Magi certainly felt compelled to travel home by a different road. They feared Herod, 
They feared for their entire life. They were forced to do that, and yet their new perspective, their new experience on that other road certainly made all the difference. Yes, the wise men took a step in a new direction, and then another one, and then another one. And they are here before us today on Epiphany because of it. If they hadn't changed routes, we probably would have never encountered them. What will your new step be today, my friend, in this new year? What will mine be? Allow me to assure you of this. Whether it's forced <coughs> or voluntary, whether it's compelled or freely chosen, that step must be yours. It must be intentional. And by all means, it must be committal. It might mean hanging upside down and viewing things from a different angle. But where God is involved, that's OK, too. For God alone is Lord of your conscience. Shall we listen for that God today? Amen.